So, um, welcome to the last session of this workshop on models old and new. Um, and we have the glad to have with us Ira Longini from, from Florida, who is going to talk about <laughs> vaccine development. The entire title is, is, is there on the screen for you. So, Ira, you have about half an hour for your presentation and uh, begin as, 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 as you like. And they're welcome. Yeah. So thank you, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be uh, virtually back here at the Newton Institute. And uh, I, I think before I get started, I'd like to note that uh, I gave a talk, the first talk at the Newton Institute in 1993, uh, when we had this inaugural meeting of infectious disease modeling. I gave that talk on uh, HIV vaccine trials. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I was very optimistic about uh, going into phase three and having an HIV vaccine. And that was 27 years ago, and we still don't have a HIV vaccine after many failed trials. So uh, let's hope uh, things are better for the COVID vaccine. And I don't jinx it by yet giving another Newton talk on this topic. So. So today's, uh, I'm gonna talk about a, a large international multi-center adaptive randomized vaccine trial for COVID-19, some dynamic statistical details for finding one uh, or more safe vaccines at warp, warp speed, which is you know, faster than even uh, uh, Donald Trump says we'll have a vaccine. <laughs> uh, so first I thought I'd define warp speed to get started. Uh, so there it is. We're moving at warp speed now, uh, which is about 300 kilometers per second. And so warp warp speed is uh, roughly uh, 9 times 10 to the 10th kilometers per second. But what does this mean for a vaccine? It means uh, we'd like to have at least one safe and efficacious vaccine uh, three to six months after beginning of a randomized efficacy trial. So that's warp warp speed. Uh, uh, here I've listed uh, oh, oh, the, uh, more than 100 uh, vaccines are under development. Uh, at, at the count here is 159, uh, and I'm showing the, uh, the different. Uh, 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 can you see my arrow? I'm never quite sure when I share the screen. Yes, can. good, good. Uh, so these are the different platforms uh, uh, going from non-replicating viral vector through DNA and RNA vaccines, inactiva inactivated vaccines, and so on. Uh, uh, other ones, uh, live uh, attenu attenuated vaccines, uh, uh, and you can see some others too. And they're all in different uh, stages of development. Uh, but the two that are the closest now to uh, phase three vaccine trials are, uh, there's a vaccine made by Moderna. It's a, it's a US company, it's the RNA vaccine. Uh, and this is the one uh, referred to as uh, hopefully uh, going uh, in warp speed. Uh, it's a two dose vaccine, it's in phase one uh, currently. And there's, uh, I wanna note that there's never been a successful RNA or DNA vaccine developed for humans uh, after many years of trying. Uh, the second one uh, is this uh, Oxford uh, chimp adenovirus uh, vaccine being developed at uh, uh, Oxford University with partners. And it's a replication deficient uh, chimp adenovirus uh, with a uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Uh, it's a one dose vaccine and it's already in a relatively large phase two uh, trials and uh, uh, should uh, probably be the first out of the box probably. <coughs> uh, before I uh, go into these vaccines and the vaccine trial, I wanted to talk a little bit about modeling uh, using uh, some joint work uh, uh, with Alex Vespignani. I don't know if he talked about this model or not when he gave his talk. But it's really about at least uh, what can we do with no vaccine or effective therapeutics, which is the current reality. And so this uh, mathematical model, uh, it's a large scale agent based model uh, 
set up with uh, layers of uh, uh, social contact and uh, distancing and so on. Uh, and uh, then what I'll show you is some results uh, using this model. It's a, uh, you know, the usual uh, SEIR model uh, for the Boston area. And it looks at different strategies for, uh, uh, you know, mitigation uh, while we wait for a vaccine and therapeutics. And uh, just kind of showing the realities of what we, what we can expect uh, in uh, much of the uh, uh, Western world that's already experienced a, uh, a, a large first wave of the epidemic, including Sweden, I should mention. And uh, the, uh, uh, on the left shows the epidemic uh, as simulated in uh, uh, and this is Boston, but you can pretty much uh, apply it to anywhere in the uh, uh, in these populations in the West that have had large epidemics. But uh, on the left, you can see, uh, you know, uh, as we lift uh, essential, uh, uh, partially lifting the essential uh, distancing, uh, you know, uh, first putting it in place, you can see the curve coming down, uh, and then the partial lifting. And as soon as that happens, if uh, we simply lifted, we get this epidemic, uh, this uh, uh, dash line, which is uh, you know a large uh, second wave. Uh, here showing the epidemic curve, and over here the uh, cumulative incidence, and over here showing the uh, effective reproductive number going above one. And then the uh, solid line uh, shows what would happen if uh, starting in, in uh, mid. Uh, May, if we did 50%, uh, we were able to do through testing, find 50% of the symptomatic cases, and then uh, quarantine uh, a proportion of their contacts. And the solid line uh, shows what would happen if we could get 20% uh, of those contacts. And the dotted line down here shows if we could get 40% uh, 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 of those contacts. So in both cases, uh, we could actually contain the epidemic fairly well uh, and just stretch it out. And again, this over here showing the effective reproductive number as we do that. So that's the uh, best we can hope for in places like the US or uh, Great Britain or even Sweden. Uh, and so uh, uh, hopefully that's going to be what happens as these different populations uh, Lift, lift their restrictions. Uh, but now back to the vaccine, uh, uh, I'm gonna to describe to you the, uh, the work on getting this uh, trial uh, designed and into the field. And uh, this is a joint work with the World Health Organization, uh, the so-called blueprint. And uh, we published the paper, uh, the group of us working on this uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine or, uh, earlier this year, uh, uh, showing uh, basically the framework that would, we would need for conducting randomized clinical trials, vaccine trials, uh, in the face of a, uh, an outbreak. Uh, just to familiarize you quickly, if you don't remember what the phases of a, a vaccine trial is, uh, phase one is a small scale, usually the tens or up to 100 individuals, uh, uh, trial for just safety and immunogenicity. Then phase two uh, just extends phase one, <coughs> uh, and that uh, is for uh, a, a larger scale safety and uh, immunogenicity, usually dose uh, ranging studies. And then uh, given that th those are successful for a certain product, then it goes into phase three, which is large scale efficacy trials, where you actually find out if the vaccine works. Uh, uh, the uh, idea uh, of uh, accelerating these uh, COVID-19 trials is to abbreviate uh, phase two or even do away with it. Uh, the the uh, background for doing this is the uh, WHO uh, R&D blueprint to prevent epidemics. And uh, the blueprint, uh, which I've been working in for the last uh, uh, five years, uh, has prioritized uh, various uh, important emerging infectious diseases. So this was done uh, uh, several years ago, and that's a list of the diseases that uh, we've been working on to try to develop vaccines and therapeutics for 
and test those uh, in the face of transmission. And you can see uh, that the, uh, in the middle that, uh, that uh, uh, these different coronaviruses were already, we were already working on those, both MERS and uh, SARS-1. Uh, and then down here, you can see disease X has always been here, which is an unknown uh, uh, pathogen, which is just uh, emerging, but we don't know what it's going to be. Uh, sorry. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, uh, given all this uh, at WHO, uh, we've worked on this idea of, uh, we call it uh, a solidarity trial for accelerating the safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and uh, there's also one of these for therapeutics, which is in the field now, and also uh, several for uh, 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 antiviral uh, agents to be used as a prophylactic, both pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, so what will the, uh, this uh, novel coronavirus vaccine trial look like? Uh, that's going to be a large international randomized control trial with multiple vaccines adaptively evaluated and adapted, adaptively is an important term as we uh, plan to evaluate uh, more than one product, more, more than one vaccine at a time. Uh, different vaccines will be available or suitable to enter the trial at different times. And for each vaccine, the primary efficacy results are expected within three to six months of the vaccine entering the trial. Uh, the uh, precedent for doing this goes back to the uh, Ebola uh, epidemic of 2014-15 in West Africa, where uh, a, a, a VSV vaccine, vesticular tom soma somatitis vaccine, was uh, developed in a vaccine trial in Guinea, a ring vaccine trial in record time. And uh, this shows the epidemic curve and the timeline. Uh, we started, uh, the idea was to get a vaccine trial into the field uh, late in 2014. The trial actually started uh, in uh, March 11, uh, sorry, April 11th of 2015. We had an answer by July 2nd of uh, 2015. So that was two and a half months for the phase three trial, which is right here, which caused, which caught the uh, descending curve of the epidemic. It was a ring vaccine trial, which means vaccine was allocated to rings. Uh, those are individuals in contact with a, a, a primary case and individuals either, rings either got immediate vaccination or delayed. And then the efficacy was estimated by comparing the, uh, the rate of uh, illness uh, uh, in the uh, immediate rings to the rate of illness in individuals in delayed rings. Uh, before they uh, got their vaccine, which was 21 days after entering. Uh, so what was a ring? There was an index case. There were close contacts. Uh, there were uh, people who lived in the same household. People visited the uh, symptomatic patient, extended family, household members of high-risk contacts, and others, neighbors. And, and uh, so it's exactly the kind of tracing we do for uh, uh, COVID-19 as well. So this is a definite design that could be used uh, for, for uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials. Uh, this just shows the result at the interim analysis, the Kaplan-Myers uh, uh, or one minus the Kaplan-Myers cumulative incidence, where the dotted line shows the uh, vaccinated arm, uh, unvaccinated uh, vaccinated arm, and the, uh, this curve up here shows what happened in the unvaccinated. And so the uh, estimate of efficacy, which was the primary outcome for this vaccine, was 100% with this confidence interval and that p-value. That p-value is almost sufficient for stopping the trial at the interim point, but the uh, Data Safety and Monitoring Board decided to stop anyway, as I said, two and a half months uh, the, uh, after the trial went into the field. And this was a secondary uh, outcome which was measuring the overall effectiveness or overall reduction in rings that got uh, uh, vaccine compared to those who got delayed. So this includes both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And this efficacy was 75%, but the trial was not powered to uh, detect this as a secondary outcome. Uh, this was published in the Lancet on July 31st, 2015. 
the vaccine uh, since then has been licensed. It was used to uh, control the epidemic in the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, the Ebola epidemic that we just had. Okay, so for uh, the current trial, this is what it's going to look like. So I'm going to show you the statistical details and some of the dynamic details of this design and what's to be expected. So the uh, primary outcome will be laboratory confirmed COVID uh, disease. Uh, the trial is set up to detect vaccines that uh, uh, we want to reject vaccines that uh, have a 30% or, or lower efficacy uh, against those that have higher than 30% efficacy. So the uh, null is uh, 0.3 and the uh, alternative uh, you know, is greater than that. Uh, and uh, the efficacy will be estimated as one minus the hazard ratio comparing the vaccinated to the unvaccinated individuals. Uh, the secondary endpoints will be, uh, there's quite a few secondary and exploratory endpoints. Uh, I should note that uh, all the uh, participating sites will, of course, do the primary endpoint, and then uh, uh, they will also do uh, efficacy against severe disease or death, efficacy, efficacy against disease for subgroups, especially the elderly, and uh, long-term efficacy against waning disease and, and enhancement with uh, any uh, alpha that's left over at that point should a vaccine be successful. And uh, we're very concerned about enhancement for these coronavirus vaccines. Uh, it's quite possible, but hopefully it won't happen, that uh, vaccinated people, uh, as their uh, uh, immunity wanes, could, could be set up for more, zero, uh, uh, more uh, severe disease, and sorry for misspelling disease here, uh, than those who are uh, uh, unvaccinated. Uh, then there's a whole host of exploratory endpoints that all the sites will not do. Necessarily will be infection, shedding, immune correlates of risk, and surrogates of protection. Uh, randomization for this uh, will be double-blinded in the sense uh, shown here. So it's a rather uh, interesting and unusual setup since multiple vaccines will be tested at one site. Uh, so it's going to be done uh, such that people can be vaccinated. They'll be randomized to a vaccine, uh, and these different vaccines could uh, will very well have different placebos. So they'll be uh, randomized to a vaccine uh, placebo combination. So they get the placebo for the vaccine they're randomized to, and then uh, uh, so they'll either once they're randomized to the group, then they'll either get vaccine or placebo. Uh, uh, their particular placebo, but then the placebos will be uh, pooled, uh, pooled for, uh, and everybody who is assessed for efficacy will be assessed against the pooled placebo. So this just shows some time windows uh, quickly. Uh, suppose uh, the vaccine is uh, one vaccine's available, then that person will either get the vaccine or placebo, and the, uh, the matching will be one to one. Uh, both uh, for the match placebo and the shared placebo. Uh, suppose a second uh, vaccine comes in, so there's two. So this shows all the combinations of which individual could get vaccine A, vaccine B, uh, placebo A, or placebo B. So the individual matching will be two to one vaccine to placebo. But again, the individual shared uh, comparisons will be one to one. And this will be the case when three vaccines are present. And we just keep uh, cascading up, uh, vaccinating pretty much after uh, there's K vaccines, then uh, you know K, there'll be K plus one uh, randomizations. Uh, uh, this shows the sample size, how how the uh, trial will be sized, uh, and uh, uh, for example, if the uh, efficacy had a, uh, we're designing it for an alternative of 60% efficacy or higher. Uh, it would take 150 total events in the, uh, for every pair of vaccine and placebo uh, for, uh, to uh, get to the end uh, with a 0.025 uh, one-sided p-value. And uh, this shows different illness attack rates in the, in the uh, first uh, three months. Uh, and uh, if we could get a 1% cumulative attack rate, uh, illness attack rate, 
then we would need uh, about 40,000 people, uh, 20,000 in the vaccine arm roughly and 20,000 in the placebo arm. And we would need this for every pair of individuals. Uh, so uh, if there's two vaccines, then we would need uh, 20,000 in each vaccine arm and uh, 20,000 in uh, the pair of placebo. Uh, okay, so uh, this just shows uh, the sample size for different uh, uh, cumulative incidents or attack rates. Uh, trial could be as big as 172,000 uh, if the uh, attack rate was quite low. Uh, and then this is for a higher F alternative efficacy, but we're, the red is uh, what we're powering the trial for. So roughly 150 events and roughly 20,000 individuals per uh, vaccine arm. Uh, is it group sequential uh, rules will be used for the interim analysis of this trial. Um, and uh, so uh, we're planning for two interim analyses uh, for success or futility. Uh, and so uh, uh, one third of the way through will be the first interim analysis, two thirds of the way through will be the second, and then there'll be a final analysis. Uh, uh, and we're using uh, one-sided O'Brien Fleming uh, boundaries for, for, for alpha spending. And so for example, and I can't show you these uh, boundaries because uh, they, they'll uh, yet, because they're, they're secret at this point, but you could probably work it out if you had some time. But the basic setup would be uh, that the, at, at one third of the way through or 50 events, uh, the, all the vaccines that, uh, hit 50 events, uh, when they hit 50 events would be assessed for uh, efficacy and then for futility. Uh, the vaccines that uh, failed due to futility would be kept in the trial, but we, we will no longer randomize to, to, uh, to, to that vaccine or its placebo. Uh, then two thirds of the way through at 100 events, and again, this is event driven, so it's different when each vaccine hits 100 events, uh, total that's both in that vaccine and the shared placebo uh, same thing will be done and then finally at the end when these each of these hit 150 events uh, then uh, we you can see the boundaries I've written them here because they're uh, they're basically what I've already stated that uh, we will uh, the goal will be to find all the vaccines that have an efficacy of greater than 50 percent and eliminate those who have efficacy less than 30%. So we would hope to uh, uh, weed out those uh, with the lower efficacy less than 30% and, uh, and find those that have an efficacy of at least 50% or more. Uh, the, uh, we, that, uh, then the uh, DSMB would, uh, uh, would uh, uh, stop randomization at that point uh, but we would continue to follow these uh, individuals, uh, including the placebo arm, until uh, one of the successful vaccines is actually available in the region where the trial participants are uh, located. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that's the basic trial setup uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the dynamic uh, you know, adaptive design and, and how things will be uh, uh, orchestrated if we go, go through this trial. Uh, how will we select the vaccines? Uh, uh, WHO has a, uh, a special process for doing that. So vaccines are going to be scored and ranked uh, using the following criteria. Uh, uh, safety, uh, no, no vaccine, of course, will get into the uh, trial unless it's shown to be safe through uh, animal studies uh, uh, and uh, phase one uh, data and phase two, if there's any phase two. Uh, the vaccines will be based on their immunity profile and uh, animal challenge studies and other criteria will be assessed uh, what, for whether they're thought that, that they will be eventually efficacious or not. Uh, vaccine stability will be looked at, uh, especially the temperatures in the cold chain. Uh, you know, how implementable are these vaccines? Do they need special uh, uh, implementation equipment? 
uh, some of the DNA vaccines require extra uh, uh, implementation. And then uh, more important, quite importantly, no vaccine will get into the trial unless they've shown the ability to, to make uh, large quantities of the vaccine and distribute the vaccine if it uh, should be shown to be successful. Uh, the other important uh, thing that needs to be done, and yet there's yet another uh, group at WHO doing this, will be to actually screen for trial sites uh, uh, to be selected for the trial. Uh, and it's going to be a combination of fixed sites, which are sites uh, picked ahead of time, and pop-up sites where mobile teams will, will go and vaccinate uh, should outbreaks occur in these pop-up sites, including ring vaccination. Uh, and so uh, the criteria for selection, selecting sites is that uh, sites need to be able to show that they can uh, maintain a 1% or higher uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, illness attack rate over six months. Uh, and how will we do that? That's going to be a combination of uh, sur uh, surveillance for the virus, zero surveys to assess how much immunity is already in the population, and um, uh, modeling projections. And we're planning to uh, use an ensembles of models that project uh, transmission in different parts of the world, models uh, uh, constructed by different modelers, and uh, try to use these models to predict uh, which areas are going to experience uh, uh, high attack rates in, in the next uh, uh, three to nine months. Uh, uh, the, uh, of course, as I said, that, so site selection de depends heavily on that potential for future outbreaks, and uh, sites have to demonstrate the infrastructure to support a large vaccine trial. So we're talking probably about a trial in hundreds of sites in, in dozens of countries involving hundreds of thousands of people, uh, maybe up to as many as a million people before it's over. So, uh, so uh, to uh, quote the Beatles, there will be an answer. Hopefully this trial will start as early as uh, July 2020, and we'll have an answer as early as October 2020. There's no reason why this can't happen. Uh, the, uh, we'll have all the infrastructure in place, and uh, we're, uh, I would uh, I strongly believe we'll have trial phase three trials in the field uh, by then. Of course, this is uh, all done uh, voluntarily by the different uh, 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 pharmaceuticals, uh, but we're hoping a good part of the uh, world's pharmaceuticals that have these vaccines will will join this solidarity trial. So thank you. So, so I was there in 1993 when you were making those projections about HIV. I've never forgotten the lesson of that. Um, and and so it seems like the the piece your piece is, looks like it's extraordinary, well well developed. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is there anything behind the curtain on the the things that you've presented just this morning that could potentially derail? the strategy that you've identified. So you tend to be very optimistic about this stuff. I know you um, uh, sort of over the years. Um, and I think then it, the second question is in terms of derailing, all of this relies on having something that's ready for a phase three trial. So what do you see as the main obstacles to getting any of these candidate vaccines uh, to that? I noticed, for example, the two that you identified as being sort of closest to that boundary right now. Um, one of them, the RNA vaccine, we don't have a single RNA vaccine, right? So, so what, what are the, you know, if we step back from the, the optimism here, what do you see as the, the, the biggest threats in both the getting the vaccine to phase three and then if we are able to start phase three, where, where's the, the biggest challenge going to be? Yeah, so um, I don't see any big threats. Uh, well, one big threat is Donald Trump because uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, is he is he in the U.S. and uh, the uh, you know will the uh, RNA vaccine even uh, participate in this? 
since the U.S. seems, uh, you know, determined to do its own trial. Again, I don't know where the trial would be done, uh, but uh, and how it could be pulled off. Uh, so one threat uh, definitely is this Politics. lack of international cooperation that we're seeing mostly from the U.S. Uh, and that could be, a, that's quite a serious threat. Uh, the, uh, other than that, uh, I don't see, uh, as I said, uh, these products, this is all voluntary, you know, pharmaceuticals. Uh, in the end, the decision is up to the pharmaceuticals, not anybody else, uh, where their product's going to be tested and how it's going to be tested. And, uh, and we've done everything possible to uh, make it clear to the manufacturers that their vac vaccine will be uh, fairly evaluated. There's no head-to-head -head comparison. And uh, the shared placebo makes it extremely uh, um, uh, advantageous to participate. Uh, so uh, I don't see an operational threat other than the you know, uh, the lack of organization uh, internationally uh, perpetuated by one particular government. But uh, as far as these products, uh, yeah, I did uh, express some pessimism about our RNA and DNA vaccines. And I think that's well founded. Uh, it's probably quite likely the, uh, the, that product will not be in this trial. It'll be in a, some kind of separate uh, US uh, um, NIH trial, uh, which is fine, uh, uh, as, but then uh, of course you lose this big advantage of, because uh, not, not only do you have uh, in the solidarity trial uh, everything under one umbrella, but you have a single uh, data safety and monitoring committee, uh, you can uh, you know, have much better evaluation and much more balanced uh, of, of a product in, in that situation and uh, having many, many separate trials, as, as you know, tends to lead to chaos. Uh, so uh, I, I don't see any strong threat. I think the enhancement issue is a big uh, potential showstopper for all these vaccines, and we, we just have to evaluate that. Yeah. yeah, just one comment on that. The If there is enhancement, and it, if correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like enhancement was fairly far down the list of the secondary or tertiary outcomes that would be evaluated in every site. It's exactly the kind of thing that the anti-vaxxers would jump on immediately. So it, it is, I think it's a threat in many different ways. Yeah, it's a secondary outcome. Uh, and one problem is none of these trials will really be powered to assess enhancement, which could come quite, you know, uh, a year after vaccination or even a couple of years. And uh, it's still, e e if it occurs, it's still a relatively rare event. Uh, you just start to see an excess, a small excess generally in severe cases in vaccinated compared to unvaccinated people. And our last experience with enhancement was with the dengue vaccine. And again, uh, it was uh, quite a rare event. So uh, although enhancement could be serious uh, in terms of the outcome, it may not be serious in terms of numbers, so we cannot uh, power these trials uh, for enhancement as a primary outcome. Carl, you had a question. Yeah, hi, Ira. Um, thanks for the talk hey, on, the, on the trial stuff. Um, so I realize this isn't exactly a science question, um, but you know, may, maybe you can make it into one. Um, <laughs> I'm good how, at that. Yeah, how would, um, how would the, the approach that you've discussed potentially dovetail with the approach that some others have suggested of, uh, of doing a human challenge trial. Yeah. Well, I think uh, this, of course, this would be complementary with human challenge trials. Uh, you can do a human challenge trial and, uh, and I, uh, I don't can know. Can you explain if... what a human challenge trial is? Not everybody knows. Yeah, yeah. So you uh, uh, vaccinate, you can find volunteers, uh, you vaccinate them with vaccine or placebo and then you uh, give them a direct challenge uh, uh, okay. with, with the virus. Uh, and uh, you really have to, add, that's where the rub comes, because what virus? Is it a, a fully virulent virus for which we have no known therapy? Or is it a, is it a lab, laboratory, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, attenuated virus? Uh, how big should the dose be? All these things. 
it, does it look anything like the, the dose one would get out, out in the world? So even though human challenge studies can be good for uh, proof of concept, in the end, uh, st you still have to do efficacy trials to find out if the vaccine actually works, given the, uh, the viruses that are out there and the uh, types of challenges people have in, in, in the real world. So I, I think human challenge studies, uh, just like animal challenge studies and primate challenge studies, uh, are good proof of concepts. But uh, of course, they're better than animal challenge studies, but uh, they still don't prove that the vaccine will work uh, when used in the, uh, under real circumstances. Of course, it, yeah. And, that, and if they fail, they don't prove they, it doesn't work because usually the challenge uh, dose and strain may be quite different and much uh, stronger. You, you know, you're giving somebody a direct uh, uh, dose of the virus uh, uh, rather than the, them picking it up from the environment. So, you, so you sort of see it more as a, if, if those kind of trials, um, if people are able to make them happen, they still become just additional candidates in this multi-arm. Right. Okay. And it, that, it, it, the, uh, um, you know, regulatory agencies include, uh, uh, do not allow animal challenge studies or uh, immunogenicity data or anything like that to substitute for a phase three trial. Uh, and so in the end, you have to do a phase three trial if you can do one. If you can't do one, then there are other pathways to uh, licensure and approval. Uh, but uh, if you can do an efficacy trial, you have to do that. Peter. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk, uh, Ira. So I had a quick uh, question playing the devil's advocate uh, a bit, uh, but uh, in the was it 2011 thing that came from Finland and Sweden, some uh, concern that there was a relation between necrolepsy and uh, the vaccine, uh, one of the vaccines tried. And my common sense says that no vaccine, you, sa you say a vaccine should be safe, but every, it does do something to your immune system. So nothing is 100% safe. There is always something which can go wrong. So how do you, can you reasonably say, exclude risks of uh, other, uh, like na necro uh, necrolepsy or if you bring a vaccine on the market within months? Well, first of all, the phase three trial, which will be in, yeah. as I mentioned, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, uh, safety is an important uh, secondary endpoint. Uh, in fact, more than a secondary endpoint. It's, it, it could, uh, so safety will be monitored very carefully in these trials. Uh, and I, uh, I could show you we're very well powered to even pick up rare events with this large number of people. But um, it is the rare events which happen within the yeah. three months, right? <laughs> Right, so uh, that's always a concern with vaccines. And of course, there'll be phase four uh, large population studies of these vaccines that are successful as they're deployed. Um. Thank you. Hi, Ira. Oh, Thank you very, very much indeed. I'm not a specialist in this particular area, but I do a lot of different uh, statistical public policy things in my life. Um, did I did I understand you to say that the trial has to you you, you can only really try out a vaccine if you've got a reasonable percentage of infection in the population? I mean, it's obvious anyway. And I read somewhere that that's one of the problems that the Oxford trial may be having. By the way, the background you can see is Oxford, which is where I'm sitting, but I have nothing to do with it. Um, uh, the, um, um, of course, if, if all these lockdown or whatever strategies work, then there won't be anywhere which has 1%. And so the human challenge may, as it was in the case of things like smallpox, be absolutely necessary. My hunch is that there would be no shortage of volunteers, actually, 
given that we know that the vaccine, given we know that the, you know, there'll be young people. And um, of course, then the question arises, what if the vaccine is only effective in young people? And then you can model all that and so on. So, so the question is, do you, do you actually think um, we'll get away without doing human challenge? And then the second, which is completely non-scientific question, but just curious, um, if, if a state governor allows a state to take part in a trial, uh, presumably the, the um, federal government can't stop them. But that's another question. Yeah, so with respect to uh, enough incidents, uh, there are really large epidemics, uh, many of which haven't even reached their peaks in uh, Latin America, in uh, India, so Southern Asia, um, uh, Africa. So I don't think we're uh, I don't think we'll be able to do these trials effectively in, in, in the parts of the Western world, developed Western world that are, that are locked down. And uh, uh, it would probably take forever, which is fortunate. Uh, the, the unfortunate part is, as, you know, as they loosen the lockdown, uh, the epidemics will get bigger and then we don't know what will happen in the fall. But I don't think there'll be a shortage of populations to do this in, uh, if it starts in July, for example, and we can get an answer in three to six months. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, obviously, if we had to only go with uh, human challenge studies, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. That's a big gamble uh, to uh, make uh, billions of doses of vaccine based on uh, uh, evidence from human challenge studies. But if we had to, we, we have to, you know, and we'll probably do something like that. Uh, and then uh, I don't think uh, in, in particular regions of countries, uh, it's really a local decision whether to participate in, in these trials from the WHO point of view. It's a regional local decision. Uh, so I don't think, uh, you know, you these uh, locations would need uh, permission from the uh, national mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, good luck. And thank you very, very much indeed for a very interesting uh, talk. And the sooner uh, we get on to the better. In fact, I'm wondering whether at the age of 68 in good health, I would volunteer for a human challenge study. Yeah. And other people in the Zoom chat will say, Bernard, don't even think of doing such a thing. Mm -hmm. So there you are. Thank, yeah. you. thank you. I would, thank you. Uh, I would mention, I think someone else also brought it up that uh, these trials will be big enough that we will certainly get uh, uh, efficacy data in the elderly. Yeah. Although we're not going to target the elderly for, for these trials. Don't no, no, you dare call me elderly. I'll log off immediately. Thank you. <laughs> Martina. Yeah. Oh, I think uh, Claudio has had his hand up. Oh, Cla oh sorry. Cla Claudio first. Okay. Yeah. But then Martina. Ladies, Thanks, ladies Martina. first. Mar Martina, go ahead and then I go after you. I've already asked a question. You go, Clark. Okay. So, hi, Anna. So, if you are still waiting for an HIV vaccine, I am still waiting for a malaria vaccine, okay? So, we have uh, 10 more years than you have in waiting uh, an HIV vaccine. So, uh, I would like to go back to uh, the ADE uh, discussion, the antibody dependent and enhancement that uh, uh, Martina brought up. So the idea is, uh, I'd like to draw an example from the dengue vaccine. So in the dengue vaccine, we had uh, the first trial and uh, the face values of this, the, 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 the main estimates of those uh, trials were showing that the vaccine was marginal at best and it was bad among children, okay? Then came a second wave of work with uh, uh, modeling the strategies to use the vaccine and the, uh, the main outcome of this exercise was to recommend vaccination. And uh, when uh, vaccination actually started, uh, we saw that uh, this was not a good idea. So uh, 
I wonder if uh, uh, ADE is an important uh, component in that, even if it is rare, uh, if uh, uh, we, we would be following the same example of the dengue vaccine and how can we uh, prevent this kind of uh, 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 pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Claudio. And, uh, and I, I've been a part of that uh, dengue story from the beginning as well, uh, went through all that. Uh, I think the ADE mechanism for uh, the theoretical one for uh, coronavirus is different than for dengue, uh, you know, being an acute infectious disease. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, we probably see it faster uh, if it's going to occur. Uh, so we should be able to pick it up in these uh, phase three trials, even though they're not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, powered uh, directly for ADE. Uh, but it is a theoretical concern, uh, and uh, we're just going to have to uh, to deal with it. And if it, uh, if we do get a vaccine, it shows up later, um, you know, then then we'll get into this whole cost benefit weighing uh, exercise that we did with the dengue vaccine. Which, by the way, I'm not convinced that vaccine uh, would probably, if widely used, would probably do more good than harm, in my opinion. But that's just an opinion. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we could use it by testing people first. Uh, so I, I just think it's a complicated uh, issue that you know we'll just have to deal with as you know data come in. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Are there any more questions? Um, if the new oh, Mark Martina has one. So. I find it interesting that uh, the idea is to potentially eliminate the phase two part of the trial sequence, uh, which is safety and dosing, right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, do you think there's, this is only when we need to go warp warp speed, uh, or is, does this suggest a more general approach to shortening the pathway by evaluating safety rigorously at steps one and three as well, so you don't need a separate step? Yeah, it's it's clearly part of the warp warp speed. Uh, uh, we, we need a vaccine quickly for this virus. Uh, and so, and we, uh, and also maybe it could be a new paradigm if the phase threes were huge, like these may be. So we could pick up a, a signal maybe in the first hundred or so uh, individuals vaccinated if there is a safety signal. and. Uh, Originally, the protocol did have that built in that we wouldn't assess efficacy in the first hundred or so uh, vaccinated people, uh, but we dropped that because uh, it just became too complex to, you know, compare all these vaccines with with, with this uh, burn-in period for safety. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it has to do with speed. Uh, we're willing to uh, sacrifice a bit for safety for the speed. Any more questions? Uh, if there are not more questions, we should thank Ira very much. And I um, understand you have a busy, well, it's a morning, morning where you are, but uh, we hope you'll engage with the programme during the coming months. So thank, but thanks very much for coming today and speaking to us. Thanks, Ira. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. It was a real pleasure. And it's great to see you, you all again, many of you. <laughs>